On the 9th of April, 1917, an Easter Monday, a passenger train left the Zürich main station on its way to the German border. On board were none other than the revolutionary Vladimir Lenin, his wife Nadezhda, and a group of 30 like-minded people. This was only the beginning of their journey, however, as their final destination, Petrograd, was still more than a week away. Lenin was smuggled out of Switzerland and financially supported by the German government, who hoped to destabilize the Russian Empire and to eventually end the war on the Eastern Front. And so, during the chaotic midst of the First World War began one of the most fateful journeys of the 20th century, one that would change the face of Russia and Eastern Europe for over eight decades. Speaking of the First World War, a quick word from today's sponsor, Supremacy 1914. Supremacy 1914 is a free-to-play online PvP strategy game, which allows you to take control of your favorite country and lead it to victory. But you're not alone. There are up to 500 other players who will compete against you in real time in games that could take weeks to complete. You can gain an advantage over the enemy by carefully choosing the right units to create the most efficient army in the world, be it tanks, plates or horses. Decide whether you want to ally with your neighboring countries or if you just want to get rid of them. What I like most about this game is that it's actually quite complex with a tech tree, an economic system and historically accurate buildings. If you want to play this game on the train or wherever, no problem, as you can play it with the same account on both PC and on mobile. By clicking the first link in the description you will get a very nice starter pack consisting of 15,000 gold marks and one month for free premium subscription. But hurry up, this offer is only valid for 30 days. In January of 1917, the Great War had been going on for two and a half years and a German victory was still nowhere to be seen. On the Western Front, the Battle of the Somme, initiated by Britain in the summer of 1916, had resulted in a costly stalemate with the front lines still remaining roughly where they were before. In the East, Alexei Brusilov had attempted to relieve his Western allies by almost simultaneously initiating a number of offensives against Germany and especially their Austro-Hungarian ally. The Brusilov Offensive had taken the lives of far more than a million soldiers and completely exhausted the Russian war effort. In the end, it was nothing more than a pyrrhic victory for the Russian Empire, as the small land gains were absolutely not worth the cost of taking them. The only sort of victory that the Central Powers could achieve was the very swift victory over Romania and the occupation of its vast oil fields. From an internal point of view, the situation was equally bleak. The morale among the German civilian population was slowly dwindling away and the general mood was at a low point. Following a terrible harvest and a potato blight in autumn, the winter months of 1916-1917 turned out to be extraordinarily cold. Combine that with the British naval blockade and with the general lack of farmers and hunger is bound to appear. Suddenly, Germany had to deal with extreme food shortages, especially in the big cities where some people only consumed 1000 calories per day. This so-called turnip winter came to demoralize many who had previously been quite enthusiastic about this whole world war thing. The conflict had to be put to an end, with a German victory of course, but the previous strategies were simply not working out. So a new strategy had to be devised. Alongside open attacks, secret operations to destabilize the enemy from within were considered as incredibly helpful to finally winning this war. Already in 1914 did Rudolf Nadolny, the head of the section politics in the foreign office, design various plans to support nationalistic and anti-imperialist movements inside the British and French colonial empires. For that, the foreign office received secret funds to finance propaganda and other subversive methods. However, all efforts to stir up an uprising in places like Ireland, Afghanistan, Morocco and the Middle East did not bear any fruits and were a giant waste of time and money. Very soon, however, the focus shifted towards the Russian Empire, especially after the first success on the Western Front. After the catastrophic Brusilov Offensive in 1916 and the ensuing crisis that questioned the legitimacy of the Tsarist regime, the Foreign Office increased their efforts of eroding Russia from the inside. Initially, they did not achieve much, because the German government was still constantly trying to achieve a separate peace with Russia. On top of that, the Kaiser was still very hesitant of potentially toppling his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II from the throne. When the Tsar was indeed toppled in early 1917, completely without foreign intervention, Wilhelm II openly voiced his support for helping radical revolutionaries. The only thing that needed to be done now was to find the perfect candidate for such an operation. At the same time, in Zürich. 
As was his habit, Vladimir Lenin left his flat in the Spiegelgasse 14 after eating lunch with his wife in order to go to the Central Library and continue his writing. Lenin hadn't seen his homeland of Russia in 10 years at this point, instead constantly moving places in his Western European exile. To avoid being arrested by the Tsarist secret police, he had decided to flee to Geneva in 1908. After briefly living in London and Paris, Lenin and his wife relocated to neutral Switzerland after the outbreak of the First World War, more precisely in the capital city of Bern. Upon his arrival, he was extremely angry and upset because of the German Social Democratic Party's decision to vote in favour of war credits. In his eyes, the Social Democrats had violated the International Socialist Congress in Stuttgart of 1907, in which it was agreed that Socialist parties should do all in their power to prevent their countries from waging war against one another. Still, he hoped that this great war would erupt into a great European civil war in which the European working class would finally rise up together and fight their bourgeois overlords in order to create a socialist utopia. But that never really happened and so Lenin met with other Russian Bolsheviks in Switzerland to discuss their ideology. In February of 1916, Lenin and his wife moved away to the city of Zurich, where they hoped to find more like-minded people than in the petty bourgeois democratic cage of Bern. There he spent most of his time reading and writing in the central library and holding political lectures in the Volkshaus, a concert hall not far away from the old town. In their free time, Vladimir and Nadezhda would often take walks in the surrounding area or buy chocolate with hazelnuts which they would then eat on the Zürichberg. In February of 1917, the news of the Tsar having been deposed, which ended the more than three century long rule of the Romanov dynasty, reached Lenin. Although he was more or less hoping that something like this would happen, he still could not believe it at first. That night he celebrated with other Russian immigrants and his wife. Still, a socialist revolution had not yet been achieved. Merely a provisional government and a Menshevik-dominated Petrograd Soviet took power who still continued to fight this brutal war. Lenin had to reach Russia as soon as possible to take advantage of the situation. In 1905 he had made the mistake of returning to Russia way too late and he was not going to let that happen again. But how? There was a front line separating Switzerland from Petrograd. The Allies would never allow him to cross the North Sea either. He devised strange plans like dressing up as a deaf Swedish man and trying to take the train through Scandinavia. His wife told him that this would never work as he would just rant about the moderate Mensheviks in his sleep and thus get caught. The German government had already had an eye on Lenin in 1915 when the German ambassador in Bern recommended him for subvert actions. He was particularly interesting because of his potential to finally sign a separate peace, which would allow the central powers to focus all their efforts onto the Western Front. However, he was just one Russian revolutionary of many. One of the most important agitators hired by the Foreign Office was Alexander Parvus, an anti tsarist socialist who was working in Copenhagen alongside the German ambassador in Denmark. He had received more than 1 million Reichsmark to finance the destabilization of Russia. After the Tsar got overthrown in February, the thought of smuggling Lenin into Russia finally became really interesting. The German diplomat in Copenhagen, Ulrich von brockdorf ranzau sent a telegram to Berlin recommending immediate action. It is imperative that we now seek to create the greatest possible chaos in Russia and do everything we can to deepen the divisions between the moderates and the extreme parties. The ambassador in Bern recommended the same thing. And so German imperialists entered a faithful collaboration with radical Russian socialists. In order to avoid being accused of collaborating with the enemy, Lenin only agreed to enter talks with the Germans through middlemen. Initially, Robert Grimm, one of the leading voices of the Swiss Socialist Movement, took over that role and met four times with the German ambassador. However, Grimm never liked Lenin all that much and eventually grew frustrated over the constant infighting within the Russian revolutionary circle. So, the Swiss communist Fritz Platten replaced him. After one month of tiresome discussions, a deal was finally reached. Lenin and his entourage would be transported from Zürich to Petrograd. While crossing through Germany, the train wagon which they were in should receive extraterritorial status and be closed off to the outside world. Additionally, Fritz Platten should accompany them and serve as a neutral contact person between the revolutionaries and the German guards. He also demanded that all travelers should pay the train fees themselves. Lenin was really trying hard to make everyone believe that he was not collaborating with the German Empire in any way, shape or form. 
On the 9th of April, the journey could finally begin. Before departure, the group held a banquet in a restaurant not far away from the main station. There, farewell speeches were held. On the previous day, Lenin had written a letter to the Swiss working class. The objective conditions of the imperialist war are a guarantee that the revolution will not be limited to the first stage of the Russian Revolution, that it will not be limited to Russia. Now, after March 1917, only a blind man can fail to see that this slogan is correct. The transformation of the imperialist war into civil war is becoming a fact. This letter really coincides with his aforementioned hopes that Europe would finally erupt into a civil war after his successful revolution. After they had eaten, they went to the Zürich main station and took a regular train to the town of Schaffhausen. On board were the revolutionaries Lenin, his wife Nadjeshta, Karl Radek, Inessa Armand, Grigory Sinoviev, Grigory Sakolnikov and the mediator Fritz Platten, among many others. In Schaffhausen, they changed trains and continued their way to the German border town of Gottmadingen. There, the travellers were welcomed by two German officers who led them to their carriage. It was a green carriage with three second-class and five third-class compartments. It also included two bathrooms and a luggage storage. It was closed off in the sense that three of its four doors were shut close, so technically people could still leave. In the rear of the carriage, the Russians painted a white line with chalk on the ground, which was supposed to separate them from the accompanying German officers. Only Fritz Platten was allowed to cross this line. As the evening approached, the locomotive began its journey through Germany. At nightfall, it stopped in the small town of Singen, right next to the Hohentwil, a long inactive volcano with a castle ruin on top. On the next day, the train made its way to Frankfurt. Very quickly, the first tensions arose. The constant noise that the others made really annoyed the already permanently agitated Lenin, who wanted to use the journey to continue working on his writings. When he couldn't bear it any longer, he burst into the neighbouring compartment and attempted to banish Sara Ravich, even though she wasn't the one responsible for the noise. Karl Radek was. He was also annoyed by his co-traveller's smoking addictions. He made it so that everyone who wanted to smoke a cigarette would have to do so in the bathroom. As you can imagine, this caused a very, very long queue. And so Lenin started a system of rationing the bathroom access by handing out two different types of tickets with various priorities. On the 11th of April, their carriage continued to the capital city of Berlin. After a long, long rest, they began the last trip within the German Empire and reached the coastal town of Sassnitz, where they boarded a ferry that took them to Swedish Trelleborg. From that point on, they would travel on regular trains again. A night train took them to Stockholm, where the mayor Karl Lindhagen enthusiastically welcomed them with a rich breakfast. Lenin became sort of a celebrity after the newspapers published a picture of him. After buying some clothes, the journey continued to the Swedish border town of Haparanda. After being searched by the Russian guards, the revolutionaries crossed the border into Finland and took the next best connection to Petrograd through Helsinki. And finally, after seven days of traveling, Lenin reached the Russian capital. Even he himself was surprised by the massive crowds of people that awaited him. An orchestra played the Marseillaise for him, and a woman gave him a bouquet of flowers. However, Lenin didn't quite like the Marseillaise, and he didn't know what he was supposed to do with those flowers. He made his way to the waiting room, where he gave a rousing speech in front of a few supporters. The whole of European imperialism could collapse any day, if not today, then tomorrow. The Russian revolution that you have carried out has initiated this collapse and opened up a new era. Long live the World Socialist Revolution. The operation had been successful. In order to help the Leninists to seize power, 400 other revolutionaries were also smuggled to Russia between May and June of the same year. On top of that, unbelievable sums of money were sent to Petrograd through neutral Sweden. This money was partially used to finance a modern printing press, which they used to print 41 different newspapers targeted towards all sorts of readers. With German financial support, more than 320,000 newspapers were printed every single day. The most famous of these newspapers was clearly the Pravda, or Truth in Russian. In summer of 1917, Lenin was publicly accused of collaborating with the Germans and was considered guilty by the Russian prosecutor general. However, there was a lack of evidence to support this claim at the time. And so, the months passed by, and Lenin did his thing. The German government in Berlin was ecstatic when they finally heard the news of the successful October Revolution. All of this money, and all of the investment, had paid off. 
for now at least. Lenin and the Bolsheviks needed to consolidate their power, as only Moscow and Petrograd could be considered as loyal to the new government. Elsewhere, things looked very different. In central Russia and on the periphery, the Bolsheviks lacked support. Lenin urgently needed to get out of this war to focus on his many internal enemies. And so, on the 15th of December 1917, an armistice between Russia and the Central Powers was finally signed. A few days later, open negotiations began in the fortress town of Brest-Litovsk. It was a strange meeting, as representatives from the old imperial European order, such as the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, Ottokar Graf Chenin, came face to face with 28 Russian representatives who came from a lower class background. They were all sailors, workers, women and soldiers led by Leon Trotsky. The German delegation was very interested in creating an informal empire in Eastern Europe through a series of small puppet states. Trotsky attempted to stall the negotiations for as long as possible because he hoped that the war-weary masses would soon rise up in other European countries. He felt validated in his hopes when in January, huge strikes broke out in Germany and in Austria. The increasingly impatient German diplomats then signed a separate peace treaty with the recently proclaimed Ukrainian People's Republic in February. Enraged, Trotsky broke off all negotiations, which briefly caused the war to resume. After capturing Kiev, the Bolsheviks finally decided to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, in which they lost control over almost all non-ethnically Russian territories in Eastern Europe. It was an area of about 1.6 million square kilometers in total, with very important natural resources and industrial centers. The peace was harsh and expensive. As such, Lenin was criticized from all sides for being an opportunist and a demagogue. But in the end, the deal paid off for him. It allowed the Bolsheviks to focus their military strength on fighting the civil war, which they would eventually win after several years. It also gave them time to establish their regime of terror, with the Cheka at its head. For the German Empire, the peace and all the efforts that were invested into it turned out to be completely futile. The army was unable to break through the front lines and to capitulate France. In November of the same year, the war was lost. A revolution swept through Germany, deposed that of its monarchs and established the Weimar Republic. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was ultimately declared invalid in the Treaty of Versailles. The Soviet Union, which Germany helped create with vast amounts of money, would shape the history of the world for the coming century. Alright then, danke schön for watching the video, and I hope you've learned something. If you like my content, then a like and a subscribe would be very much appreciated. An extra big thank you goes out to my generous supporters on Ko-Fi, namely A Cup of Tea, Drix, Tristan Kriegsmann and Ryan Layton. You are a fantastic bunch. Anyway, have a very nice day and see you next time. Just to remind you, Supremacy 1914 is a free online PvP strategy game set during World War 1, which allows you to choose your own strategy and take over the world. By clicking the first link in the description you will get a very nice starter pack, consisting of 15,000 gold marks and one month of free premium subscription. But hurry up, this offer is only valid for 30 days.